so the purpose of today's session, in case you're confused, it's not training. Um, don't, don't, please don't see it as that. If you see it as that, you'll be disappointed. It's really to take you through the workflow of the Creative Cloud. And I'm going to cover, hopefully if we have time, I'm going to cover about a dozen of the Creative Cloud applications today, as well as a bunch of the services. So really what I want to do is really just introduce you maybe to some features that you didn't know, maybe some you did know, um, some applications that you might not be aware of that are in the Creative Cloud, but also um, workflows between. How do, how do you work between the products? How do you create stuff um, quickly? Now, I've got a huge amount of content, so I am going to go very fast. Um, as I said, it's not training, but you'll, you'll sort of see some ideas where you can go away, get some inspiration, and maybe um, start to build some stuff. So the concept of today, as you heard yesterday um, on stage, is that I have a new customer. Um, it's an imaginary customer, so again, please don't go looking for them. It's, it's, um, so this is the brief. Imagine that you arrive at work in the morning, um, the account executive comes in and says they've just got off the phone with um, a new client. So here's the brief. So it's a new client. It's a cafe called Mad Coffee. Um, it was established in 1963. It's situated on the beach in, in Australia. Um, and it's aimed at surfers. And it's run by a bunch of hipsters. Okay. Now, they need some design elements. Files for print posters, a trifold signage. They need designs and prototypes for mobile apps and phone and tablet. They need a website design. They need some video, some animation, and even a game. So what do they have? Nothing. And when do they want it? Today. So I've got to really quickly build an awful lot of content um, today um, for this company. So let me, let me jump out of here. And the first thing I'm going to do is, when I say they have nothing, it's actually a lie. Um, we started, I, I went down to the beach. If you want to know where it is, it's, um, my son lives at Pambula Beach um, down on the south coast. Um, so I went there at Christmas on holiday and I took some pictures. Um, and I'm actually a, a photographer. This is one of my photos. Um, but... Um, <laughs> the photos that I'm going to show you today are literally just phone snaps that I, that I took quickly. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, jump into Lightroom CC. And here's just a bunch, literally, really bad phone pictures that I took um, at Christmas. A whole bunch. You met, you met Junie the dog yesterday. You'll see a bit more of her later. Um, but I took a few pictures down on the beach. Um, for example, uh, this one here. Um, is an old beach hut down on the river mouth at Pambula, and I'm going to work with that in a minute. Um, you saw the picture yesterday, if you were in the session, of um, Matt on his stand-up paddleboard with little Junie, the dog. Um, and also, I've got a picture of, um, picture of my wife, Mong Chi, that you'll see a little bit later. Um, this is Mong Chi. You can tell she fell in. Um, so she's not, she's not so good. Um, well, she, actually, she is quite good on the paddleboard, but... Um, Anyway, she did fall in. Um, and, a, and a few other sort of pictures um, down here that will come into it later. And, of course, starring Junie the puppy. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, you'll see a bit more of um, Junie later. But what I want to do is talk about um, Lightroom Mobile first, or Lightroom CC. Now, Lightroom CC, we used to have Lightroom CC. <laughs> And just to confuse you, we changed the name to Lightroom Classic. And we introduced a new pro pro product called Lightroom CC. <laughs> You've got to love our marketing department. They're awesome. Um, but um, <laughs> but um, the purpose of Lightroom CC is it's a sort of a future product. Um, we launched it last year at Max. The idea of it is that um, the same product is on desktop, it's on phone, it's on tablet, 
and it's also in a browser. So, in fact, anywhere you go, in any browser on any machine, you can log in and have all of your um, photos that you create. So everything's in the cloud. You take a photo, it goes to the cloud, you can edit it anywhere. Any edits I make on my phone are available on my desktop and vice versa and everywhere I take it. So Lightroom is the product that photographers use around the world um, to make great photos awesome. So um, this is not a great photo, and I'm not going to make it awesome. But the thing that I wanted to show really quickly is just how simple it is to edit and take a photo um, somewhere. Now, with any photo, when you take a photo, you're trying to tell a story. And you can take a photo in different directions in post-processing to tell different stories. Now, the story that I want to tell with this one, I want to make this look like the 1963 beach hut. This is going to be the mad coffee shop from back in 1963. So I want to try and make this look old. So what I'm going to do is jump into the editing of it. And I'm actually going to do something now which we've always told you never, ever, ever, ever do. As a designer or a photographer or whatever, I'm going to click the auto button. <laughs> now, in the past, the auto button's terrible. Like, it's just, really, it's just, you do it once and you get, yeah, that's not working. We've done a lot of work in the auto buttons, not just in the Lightroom, but also in Photoshop and a bunch of other applications as well, to actually really not do a finished job for you, but get you a long way there, get you started and do a lot of things. So it's really a starting point at the click of one button. So when I click on auto, what we're doing is using Adobe Sensei um, to actually compare it to millions of other images that have been edited the same, that look the same and do some things. So you'll notice that one thing that it just did then, you can actually see here what it's done. It's adjusted my highlights, shadows, the whites and the blacks. So it's actually taken my image that was quite sort of squashed on the histogram and it's now made the white points of the black points right at the... So I've got the whole histogram to work with now, adjusted some of the highlights. Now this is not actually um, the sort of image that I want. I've also noticed that because I was down low when I took the photo, that the wall of the, of the hut are lined in a bit, and I want to sort of straighten it up a bit. So I'm going to jump down to this panel here, Geometry, and I'm just going to open that up. <laughs> I'm going to open that up, and I'm going to turn on Upright and use Guided. And what I'm going to do is just come across into the picture and say, well, that line there should be vertical, and this line here should be vertical, and it automatically straightens up the image for me. Um, I can do the contain crop on that, and I'm happy with that, so I'm going to turn, it, turn that off and now start working on it. So as I said, what I want to do is I want to make it look like an old photo. So probably in order to do that, I'm actually going to make it a little bit, um, a little bit less, contra or less contrasty. I'm going to drop the shadows down a little bit. I'm going to push the exposure up a bit, sort of push it over the top a little bit to make it look like an old photo. I'm going to come into the colour and I'm going to pull the vibrancy down just to make it a bit more washed out sort of look. Um, and then I'm going to come down to effects and I'm just going to add a vignette around the edge. Now I'll add a big vignette to start with, but then I'll just toggle that open and I'm going to turn the roundness right off. I'll turn the midpoint in a little bit, sort of pull that in, give it that old sort of photo look, maybe a bit, a little bit less feathering on there just to give it that. And then I'm going to come down and add a whole heap of grain to the photo. So just in, a, in two minutes, I've taken a photo. It's not necessarily a great photo. It didn't start off great. It hasn't necessarily finished, but it's got that old look. So I can take a photo and tell a story really quickly in Lightroom. If you're out with your mobile phone, you take a picture, how many of you take a shot and straight away you just publish that up to social media? Spend two minutes in Lightroom Mobile and you can really push, push that image a lot further, get a lot more out of it um, and do something cool. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this image later, but just really touch you on Lightroom so you know, know that it's available. So I need to create some content. So the first thing I want to do is, is um, build a logo. And if you were sitting in the middle section, apologies to the people on the side, I ran out. There's still a few spare down here. Uh, I put a little Mad Coffee logo sticker there if you want. It's a bit of fun. Um, but what I'm going to do is jump into Illustrator. And I've actually got the logo here. But there's one thing that I wanted to show you with this logo that's sort of special, is that the font for Mad is exactly the same as the font for coffee. And it's exactly the same font face. 
You go, what? No, 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 it's like the mad is black and the other one's like light or regular. It's not, they're the same. Why is that? Because what I've used is a new style of fonts that are available. So if I select this font, you'll notice at the top here, I've used a font called Acumen Variable Concept. So we've introduced just recently into Illustrator variable fonts. What's a variable font? There's a whole bunch available. There's more available as you come. But you'll notice up here I've got this little button, this variable font button, and I can open it up and I can control the weight, the width and the slant of this font. Now, different variable fonts have different settings. You can actually do different things with different variable fonts is how it's built into it. But you'll notice on here, I can pull the weight down to here. I can change the width of it and I can also change the slant of it and make it italic. So with the one font, rather than trying to look, mm, do I want this face, do I want that face, well that face is not quite the thickness I want, etc. You basically have total control um, over the font that you're using. That's variable fonts inside Illustrator. Okay, let's jump to this file. Does that look like a surfboard? Why are you laughing? No, okay, so it's not a very good surfboard. What I want to show you, the feature that I want to show you here is really optimising your work inside Illustrator. We have a tool, if I jump across here, called the width tool. It's actually a variable width tool. So I'm going to grab the variable width tool and I'm going to come into these two lines and I'm just going to adjust the width of the line in different places that I want here and I'll just stretch that out and now I've got a surfboard. The cool thing about this is that if I look at the outline, it's just two lines. All I had to draw was two lines. What this means is that when you're doing artwork inside Illustrator, you can create really complex designs with much, much fewer lines, with more, less points, etc. So if I want to come in, you know, I want to come in and, and edit some of this, I'm just, I'm just editing, you know, a couple of points rather than having to edit all of those different points around that I um, created. Okay, I'm coming back to Illustrator later on, but I'm going to jump ahead. As you notice, today is going to be seriously fast, so I'm just showing you a bunch of stuff. Now, I used a variable font for the logo, but what I want to do now is work out what font I should use for the rest of my content, for the stuff that I'm going to do for print, for web, etc. And while I was in Pambula at Christmas time, I was walking down by the old coffee shop, work with me, I'm walking down by and through the sand and I stubbed my toe in the sand on a piece of wood and I brushed the sand away and what did I find? I found from back in 1963 the old menu board from the shop, work with me, um, <laughs> and... And this is, this is the old menu board, and I'm thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if I used the same font that they used back then? Now, this is, you know, a, a phone picture that I took with my phone. Work with me. Um, and so what I've done in, inside here... Now, this will, work, this will work with any font. If you go out with your phone, you see a font, even if it's a hand-painted font, you can take a picture of it, bring it back to Photoshop, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to, underneath the type menu, come down to match font. Yeah? So I choose match font. All I need to do is just move this little box around the font that I want to match. And then what Photoshop is doing is using Adobe Sensei to look at that font, you did it, um, to look at that font, and it's looking first of all at the fonts on my computer, and then it's also looking up in the cloud at Typekit. Now, Typekit, if you've got Creative Cloud, you have access to thousands of fonts inside Typekit. So you'll notice up here, <laughs> and of course, of course, Gotham turns up because if you're a hipster, that's the font. Um, but if you, if you, um, <laughs> if you don't have Gotham um, and paid for that, I've, I'm going to choose... So if I choose Gotham first, OK, that's obviously a, a, a heavier version of it. Um, that, yeah, black. Um, but if I choose um, Proxima Nova, well, it's pretty much... That's pretty close. That's actually a Typekit font um, that I've downloaded already. It's on my machine um, from, as you can see, from Typekit. Um, so I've got that there ready to go. I'm happy. That's what I'm going to use. I'm going to use Proxima Nova across um, all of the content that I've got. OK, this next feature um, is going to change your life, I hope. I hope. Um, <laughs> it's a big call, isn't it? Um, 
what you do inside Photoshop a lot is selecting. You select something to change the colour. You select something to cut it out and put it somewhere else. Um, I've got an image here. It's not too hard. It's against a cloudy background. How long would it take you to select this girl? Now, what, what's the hard thing about this image to select? Yeah, now, I don't have that problem. But, <laughs> but with, with this photo, how long would it take you to select her absolutely perfectly with every single strand of hair? How long? At a guess, anyone? Someone. Half an hour? Okay, we don't, we don't have half an hour. That's pretty much I've, take up the whole session. I'm going to see if I can do it really quickly. What I'm going to do, this is how you now select inside Photoshop. Um, much, much quicker ways of doing it. So if people selected different ways, use channels, use you know, all sorts of tools. Um, but this is the way you select. I'm using, obviously, the quick selection tool. Again, our marketing department called it that name, which is awesome. Um, and so I'm going to select that. And up the top here, I have a button called Select and Mask. When I click on that, it takes me to a panel that all of the, everything on the screen now is all about selecting and masking, just the tools I need to select and mask. So I'm going to start off selecting her first of all. You see, it's, it's sort of turned her semi-transparent. I can adjust that. What I'm going to do is, first of all, just draw down her. Now, you'll see it's done a pretty good job. It's even known not to select the area under her arm. The rest of it is quite good. I haven't done the hair yet. So let's select the hair, but it hasn't done a great job here. There's the cloud is still inside here. So I'm going to grab my Refine Edge brush tool, and I'm going to come across, and I'm going to clean up that hair, and I'm going to get every single strand of hair back and get rid of the cloud behind all of that, clean up the little bit under there, and save it as a new layer with a layer mask, and I'm done. That's how you select inside Photoshop now. Much, much quicker. There are a bunch of other tools there which I'll come back to. And in fact, I'm going to make a mistake now. Let's revert that file and go back. And I'm going to do it again. I'll grab Select and Mask. And this time, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to come down a little bit further. And you'll notice that down here, it's actually selected some of the bush. Because Photoshop doesn't know the difference between a leg and bush. You know, it's a bit confused. What I'm going to do is hold down my Option key. And using Adobe Sensei, I don't need to really carefully draw down here. I just need to say to Photoshop, I don't want that, and it redraws. It actually works out. It says, oh, you don't want that stuff, but you do want the other stuff. And I can keep doing it. It's actually using machine learning. So the more you do, the more it learns. If I click back, if it got rid of some of the leg, I just click back on the leg, and then I come off to the side, and I come down here and get rid of some of that. You can actually see Adobe Sensei working. I've sort of done all the bits now. But if I do this bit here, you'll see it for a split second, have a think, and redraw that edge down there. If I do it again and just click on there, you'll see how it had a little think and it redrew the edge down. So it's actually learning as I do it. OK, so that's, that's um, a whole bunch of other tools down here. You'll also notice if you've used this in the past, you've used decontaminate colors. We've only just added about a week ago. We added, if you choose that, you can actually adjust the amount now, which gives you a better control. Why decontaminate colors? If you shoot against something like a green screen or a blue screen, and you know how you get that sheen sometimes on the edge of the colour, that's what that decontaminate colours is for. Okay, so I'm going to hit cancel on that. So you're saying, okay, well, that image is pretty easy. That's Oh, I, sorry, I was going to show you one more thing up here. I showed this yesterday, select subject. Um, again, don't just... Don't just click it, put some passion into it. Um, if I click select subject, so basically that these two buttons up here become available whenever you grab any selection tool, marquee, lasso, quick selection tool, any of those things, you'll get these buttons. So I'm going to click this quick selection button and click one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> oh, okay, six. Um, so it's selected her and done a really good job. Now, I still need to clean up the hair. You'll notice that's not done. So I still just jump into the Select and Mask, grab the Refine Edge Brush tool, and do that, and I'm, I'm done. So, so pretty quick. OK, but you're saying, well, that image is not that hard. So what about, what about a harder image? This has um, got a little bit more complex background, a little bit harder. This time, you really need to put a lot of effort into hitting this button and a lot of passion and thought. And you click it, and you think about it, and you click it hard. And if I click it, and one, two, three, four, five, poof, again, it's only 95% of the way there. I've still got a little bit of hair over on this side here of the shoulder and some down the side. I need to clean that up. But one click gets me 95% of the way there. 
and then I need to maybe just go in and clean up the rest of it. Okay, you're going, yeah, still, still a little bit easy. And this is the one that I did yesterday, Matt and Junie on the, on the stand-up paddleboard. Um, with this one, I need all of you and all of your power and thought to do it. So as I click the button, all with me now, and I click the button. So again, it's going to select Matt. Selected Junie, selected Junie's reflection. Still, I need to clean up Matt's feet a little bit, but the rest of it, like in one click, gets me a long way there. This is all using Adobe Sensei. Why are we doing this? Because you don't want to be spending half an hour selecting a subject. That's not creative. You didn't go to design school to, to learn that. You, we, we, what we want to do is give you time back to be creative, to spend more time designing and less time doing the busy, boring stuff the, the laborious stuff that you have to do um, as a designer. So that's the purpose of a lot of these, um, these features. Okay, um, this next one I'm really not sure about. He's one of our hipster baristas. Um, and I'm really not sure about showing this. I'm not a fan of this feature, but I'm going to show you. If I want to retouch something like this, a uh, person like this, people doing this all the time, retouching people, um, the tool of choice within Photoshop is the liquify tool and people use this to do this all the time so if i jump into the liquify tool maybe i want to make him look a little bit more muscly you know people i kid you not come in here and you know you just start to you know make his shoulders a bit a bit bigger let's make him look like really big people do this and make people look absolutely you know what i'm talking about it's crazy the feature that I want to show you inside here is the face tool. If I choose the face tool, you'll notice that it automatically identifies the face. If I had more than one person, it would select them for each of them. And if I zoom in, let's actually zoom in a little bit first so you can um, see this a little bit better. Um, if I grab the face tool, it selects it, not just the face, it selects the outline of the face, even though he's got a beard, it's worked out where the face would be. It's got the mouth, the nose, and each of the eyes. Now, here is my piece of advice for this. With great power comes great responsibility. And you should use this tool for good and not evil. Um, please don't grab a picture of a friend and make them look stupid. Although, that said, I'm going to see if I can make him look as silly as I can. So I could literally come in here and just start to adjust. I'm going to, let's, uh, let's do that. Let's give him a really thin face. Let's yeah, pull that in. I can sort of... Yeah, adjust that. Uh, let's make him have bigger, bigger lips inside here. Uh, let's make him have a really narrow mouth. I don't even smile and frown. Let's make him do a big frown. Um, I can play with the nose. Let's do a little, little tiny nose. And I, I might make his eyes as um, big. Now, you'll notice that while I'm doing this, I'm just pulling these, these things. I'm not having to do special masking and carefully adjust things in there. Um, Sensei is clever enough to actually recognise it all. I've even done people with glasses on and it will still do the eyes. It's, it's actually quite scary. So, um, you know, here now is our... Um <laughs> our, happy, our happy barista. Um, yeah, please, again, again, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of this feature, but please use it for good. Um, and not evil. Now, when I was down in Pambitter, I have a drone, and I took it out early morning when it was really light, and I took this picture, but it was very hazy, very light, you know, that early sunshine light, and it was like, so the image is a bit washed out. Now, mostly you grab an image like this, throw it away. But what I'm going to do is come up underneath my filters, oh, and show you a filter in here, not just for this one purpose, but show you this one here, the camera raw filter inside Photoshop. What is the camera raw filter? The camera raw filter is almost like all of Lightroom in one plugin inside Photoshop. So all the stuff that I showed you before is in Photoshop in one plugin. Now it's called camera raw, but you actually don't even need to use a raw photo. This is just a JPEG image. So once I open it up, you'll notice that across here on the side, this is all, this is all the stuff that I had inside Lightroom and all of the different panels across here. So I can, I can do editing, even on a JPEG or a raw image, it doesn't matter. But you'll notice that underneath Basic, if I zoom down, there's one here called Dehaze. Yep. So if I zoom out, and this will work with any, any shots. If you take a hazy shot, a foggy you know, shot, um, on a hot day when there's that heat haze and the mountains are a bit washed out. If you do um, scuba diving and you take photos, just the fact that the amount of water between you and a fish, you can actually use this um, to adjust. I'm a, I also do a lot of astrophotography. For astrophotography, this is awesome. 
this dehose is really, really quite, quite cool. So what I'm going to do is just turn that up and just slide it up and get rid of all of that haze um, inside the image. So seriously, simple to do. The funny thing is you can actually add... You can go the other way and actually add haze to it. I don't know, maybe on a Monday morning if you, go, you don't want to go to work, you go outside, take a photo. Yeah, I'm not going to... I've never done that. OK. But seriously, simple to do. Now, you'll notice that inside this photo over here, there's these little purple flowers here, and I took a photo, um, I took a photo of them. But when I took it with my phone, I, I moved the phone. I adjusted the phone a little bit, so it's blurry. So normally a photo like this, you just throw it away. Or inside Photoshop, I come up to uh, filters underneath sharpen and come into shake reduction, select that, and um, basically what we're doing using Adobe Sensei to reverse engineer that movement. So it's not always just movement up and down and across. It's also pitch and roll and yaw, etc. So you'll notice inside this image that there's still a bit down here because the camera's moved in a different angle. So I can actually add a different area to there, sharpen that up as well, and it's actually creating all of these different sections for me of knowing where on what parts of the image to do it. So if it doesn't work the first time, just click around um, and adjust it. So, OK. Uh, now, oh, this is actually not Pambula Beach, but I couldn't find an image to do this with. I'm just going to show you one of my favourite features, apart from the select um, subject and select and mask and the quick select tool. Um, this is actually a photo I took in India um, of a sloth bear. This is like, you know, Jungle Book Balu? This is what Balu came from. So what the, my second favourite tool inside Photoshop is this one here, is the Spot Healing Brush tool. Now, all of these top four tools underneath that, all of these are using a technology called Content Aware. Um, what does that mean? It means that you're using Adobe Sensei and Photoshop looks at the image and when, rather than deleting something using a clone tool or something like that, Photoshop is actually looking around it at the content and filling it intelligently. It's not just sort of pacing it in there. So if I use the spot healing brush tool on side here, and I'll, whoops, I'll just jump out and zoom in a little bit so you can see. I'll just grab this. Seriously, I just adjust my brush size with my open and close brackets tool, and I can just start cleaning in here. And really, it's so super fast just to be able to move around and click. And it's looking around it cleverly, intelligently, filling all of this um, with areas. You can clean up a, a something, not having to use the clone tool and which bit shall I copy and paste in, etc. It's also, depending on your brush size and the brush... Um, furriness, which is not the technical term, um, the, <coughs> the feathering. Um, you, you, you can have it adjust the edges and fit in everything as well. So, favourite um, one of mine. OK. Um, I'll just do this picture of Mong Shi really quickly here. Um, say, for example, I want this picture, but it's at the moment it's a, in a portrait shape. I want it to be a landscape sort of photo. I want to put it up on a wide, wide banner. Um, so, a couple of tricks inside here. If you wanted to increase the size of the canvas, most of you would go up to um, the canvas size and you type in the numbers, yep. You don't need to do that. If you just want a bit more canvas space to play with, just grab um, the crop tool and just crop out. You don't need to crop in. You can actually just crop out. I now want to build designs and prototypes for mobile apps, for um, websites, etc. Um, and in order to do that, I'm using Adobe XD. Now, you saw, again, a lot of you would have seen this yesterday, but I'm going to go through it um, quickly and hope it doesn't crash on me. OK, so I've created in here, this is very simple. You saw one yesterday with 1,500 artboards in there just behaving really quickly. This is a very small site. It's just a little coffee shop. Um, so I've got, I've got my tablet, my phone, and my website design down the bottom down here. Um, to run you through this really quickly, um, I'm just going to use the play button in here so I can just preview what I'm doing as I'm working. Now, the cool thing is if you have your phone plugged in um, to this, you see the little phone device preview here. If I've got a tablet or a phone plugged in, I can open up the XD app on the phone or on the tablet, and I can actually see my design working and interact with it on my phone while I'm working. So I can see if I make any little changes, instantly 
on the phone, I'm seeing them. So I want to see what it looks like on a device that's cool. But anyway, let's play, let's play this one. Um, so as you saw yesterday, small batch bespoke, handcrafted. I did a Google search on hipster terms um, and found all of these. So I'll log in. Um, and you'll notice here, I took that image that I did before into Dimension and added the little logos on it, so it's the old coffee shop. You'll notice on this image at the top, see the depth of field on the surfboard? That surfboard I just got off the web, imported the 3D object into Dimension um, and, and did it there. Um, and, oh, and, the, <laughs> and the bag over here, yes, you've got the, the made coffee bag um, there with the coffee cup. Um, inside there, but if I zoom out a little bit and go to our baristas, I'm going to build this page um, in a minute. Obviously, obviously, all of them are like you know either surfers or stand-up paddleboarders. They're all vegan, vegetarian, pescatarians. There, um, lacto. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> You, you get the idea, they're awesome. Um, all of this was to tease my son, who's a bit of a, a hipster, so I did this for that purpose. So again, here's the coffee cup that I was trying to do um, inside Dimension and for some reason crash. Um, so obviously all the coffee cups in here, yes, we do the, we do the juice as well. Um, and obviously we also do, oh, no badge on that one. We do the beans, mad beans as well um, on there. And they're all obviously, you know, fair trade rainforest alliance beans. Um, and totally sustainable. Um, yeah, compostable hot cups, everything, you know, shade grown coffee beans, it's all great. But we've also got a keep cup. Now, if I zoom in on here, how did I make the keep cup? Because there's no keep cup 3D model inside Dimension. I couldn't find one on the web anywhere. So what I did was I took that original coffee cup and I put the outside as glass. Yeah. I didn't like the, the lid. The lid didn't look like a keep cup, so I made it invisible. I then found a screw top jar in the library in there. I brought that in, made the jar invisible and put the screw top on top of the coffee cup. I then duplicated the coffee cup and shrunk it down inside and filled it with brown. And then I just put a cylinder on the outside and put the MAD logo on it. So you can actually use Dimension, <laughs> when it doesn't crash, to, um, to build stuff as well inside there or use other, other 3D objects inside there. And obviously, um, under Find Us, don't, please don't go looking for this. It's not there. But if you order a cup of coffee, yes, Matt and Junie will come out um, and deliver it. Now, just one little quick thing in here, and I'm going to show you... If I get time, I'll show you this later. Do you notice that I did this in Dimension and I put, or put all of this on here and I gave the image a bit of a, like an old Instagram sort of washed out faded feel with, the, with some colours on it? But do you notice the reflection in the water? Now, Dimension can't do that. It doesn't, it doesn't know that there's a surfboard there and etc. It just thinks it's a flat image. So what I did, when you output from Dimension, you output as Photoshop file with all the layers in it, but also selection layers in there that help you simply select the objects. All I did was use the selection layers to select the coffee cups and the bag. I then did, duplicated them to another layer and flipped them upside down, moved them down a little bit, and then just added a ripple effect to it to put them under. That's why in Dimension we give you a Photoshop file to actually allow you to do a little bit of extra work. Um, you will have noticed if I zoom back out here and I go back to the About Us page, you'll notice that this, the bag here, it doesn't know that the sand is ripply, so, the, so the, the shadow normally is just straight. So all I did in Photoshop, I just got a little bit and just cleaned up the, the shadow a little bit just to make it look like it's on the ripply sand. That's why we give you um, the Photoshop file on top of it. Okay, enough of that. Building inside XD super fast to be able to do. I'm just going to build another page and show you. I did this yesterday, so apologies to the people who were there, but some people weren't. So um, what I'm going to do is build that barista page again and just show you a few of the things inside here and maybe talk about them a little bit more than I did yesterday. So. Uh, okay, so I've got a few images up here that I'm going to use. And I'm also going to, obviously, and across all of our applications, and this is a good time to talk about it, is in every single one of our applications, we have Creative Cloud libraries. If you are not using libraries, you are really wasting your time. Libraries are, are basically tools for you to be able to save any assets on projects that you're doing. If you're doing a project for a new client, create a library. Start throwing all your assets, your logos, your colours, your fonts, your character styles, your 3D models, your 
images, whatever it is, you can put them in the library, entire Photoshop files, etc. And then when I go to another app, I just have them all. But the best thing about it is that I can share my library with anyone else, the team that I'm working with. So everyone has those assets. So if I save something, the new logo, to the library, everyone has that instantly. The best thing about that, I can do it in two ways. One is I can create a library and share it that you can change and I can change and we can all change and it's fine. Or I can own that library and I can share it with you so you can use it but you can't update it. This is awesome for doing things like, you know, if you've got the design assets that you are managing for a particular project but other people have to build content, you just let them use it. So if there's a new logo, the best thing about it, or something changes, a colour changes, a character style changes, I can change that character style. It will automatically update in your library and wherever you have used that across InDesign, Illustrator, Premiere, After Effects, wherever, it will update in the project. You don't have to go and do all of that and go, oh God, where did I use that character style, that colour and anything. It will do it all for you. Okay. Um, so. Let's build this quickly. I said I'd build it quickly. I'm going to have to seriously hurry. Um, okay, so I'm just going to put that banner image at the top. As you can see, again, created in Dimension. And I, I seriously, I apologise about Dimension. I don't know why it was crashing. Just putting an image in there. I can, I can start to do round corners. I can move that image in there. I can resize the image in there just by double clicking. I'm not going to do that now. But also, inside my library, Across here, I have, the, so this is my library for, um, for XD. I can save all of my symbols in the library. So I can select anything on the stage that I've designed or created, combination of something, and just drag it to the library, or add it as a symbol, and use it again and again. And if I update it once, it updates it everywhere that I do it. So I created the menu already, and you'll notice that XD gives me all of these positioning tools inside here just to make it easy to position the content. So I now need to put the buttons in for the baristas. So if I come in here, I'm just going to create the first one, just create a circle, um, and I'll throw Ignatius in there. Uh, yes, I, I surfed on t uh, names for hipsters and... Uh, and, and I actually match them. I think if you look at the names and the pictures, I think you'll think, yeah, they're pretty close. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I'm just going to put, throw some text in here. Now you can obviously control all of the text um, that you do, but I've already created some styles for this which I'll add in a moment. So again, all of this positioning, just to make it very, very simple to know exactly where you're placing things um, inside there, call that interest. Uh, and let's just stretch that down a little bit. Now I've created one, obviously I need six of them, so I'm going to select that. You saw this a bunch of times yesterday, the repeat grid. Um, basically it main, means that you can create repeatable lists for whatever you're creating um, very, very simply and then position them um, simply on the stage. Now the trouble is all six of them are the same one at the moment, so I'm just going to grab the rest of the images of the other baristas and place them in there. I've got some text. What is this text? The text is just um, return delimited lists, you know, so you can create any of your content inside here. I've got their names. I can just drag that on. I've got their interests. I can just drag this on. Obviously, this is content that would be database driven inside an app or a website, um, etc. Once you've done that, any of these things inside here are editable. And again, if I had my phone plugged in at the moment, or this is a tablet app, so if I had my tablet plugged in, I can actually look at it on the tablet as I'm moving these around. I'll move on the tablet and see what I'm doing. OK, let's grab the text and move that up. I'm sort of happy with that. But I want to add the styles to it. So if I come across and grab the name, I can put the style on there for that. And um, so I don't know, with the names, do you think they sort of match? I, I think, yeah, I love it like Zane. Like, seriously, is that a Zane? It's, yeah. Um, okay, so once I've done this, obviously I then want to make it interactive. I want to build a prototype for it. I'm just going to do this quickly. At the moment, I've been working in the design tab. I'm going to jump to the prototype tab. And in order to do this, all I need to do is just select one of these things, drag it to another page. Let's just assume that if you clicked on Ignatius, it takes you to the Where Are We page. So I'm going to click on here. Let's just make that uh, slide right. And I'll just check what that looks like. So let's click on Ignatius, slide right. Yeah, that's what I want it to do. But I can't get back at the moment. So let's imagine that if I clicked on the map over here, it's going to take me back to this page and this time I'm going to slide left, let's come across and see what that looks like. Yeah, it looks good. So I'm really quickly building um, a prototype as well as the application. Now, 
you'll notice across here if I select some of these pages, so if, say for example I select, let's close that up for a minute, if I select the About Us page, I don't need the menu anymore, do you see all these lines across, basically it's the menu jumping me to all of the different pages, the Brewsters, etc. To do the iPad prototype, to do all of that, literally, I kid you not, took me probably 10 minutes to do all of those links across for each one, or less, less than 10 minutes. It's pretty quick. Once you start working through it, it's pretty quick to be able to do. Sometimes you want a link. So, for example, down on the mobile phone one, I wanted people to, to log in. So if I zoom in um, on here a little bit, when people log in, I'm on this page here, you'll notice that I've got this little broken line link to here. And if I open that up, you'll notice that I've done it as an overlay, not a transition. So it'll actually overlay on the page, and I want it to slide up. So what does that look like when I run it? If I run the iPad app, uh, sorry, the iPhone app, and I log in, it opens up the login window for me, I can click that and log in to, to the site. And so I'm just actually, actually working through the workflow as well. So overlays, etc. building a prototype. You saw yesterday during the XD app that once I've finished all of that, I can publish a prototype, share it with my co-workers, with my colleague, whoever needs to do approval on it with the client. They get a web um, link. They open it up in the web, they can click through it, they can look, they can feel what it's like, they can see it working, and they can add um, comments to specific points in it. So they just drag a pin across, put it in it, and say, could you make the logo bigger, which is what clients do. Um, and it's very simple to be able to do. Give the comments, I get those comments back, I can change them. Once I've, everyone's approved it, I can then publish the design specs um, and give that to the developer, um, who has, has basically then has the access to all of the information about what they need to do, all of the um, positioning, sizing, colours, text, even the content um, in there as well. And then obviously I would export underneath here all of the content. So say for example if I do batch, so when I'm, why, why batch, I should just show you this really quickly. If I'm inside my, let's zoom back out, if I'm inside my layers and I particular, the particular page and I open up my layers and select here, you'll notice that inside here in order to add something, so this is all, all the layers for that particular page, if I want to batch process the background, I just click on that and it's marking it for batch export, which means later when I batch export, that's going to export for me. How is it going to do that? When I go to export and say batch, I can do it either as a PNG, SVG, PDF, JPEGs, etc. So I choose what I want it to do as. Um, do, am I just outputting it for design or do I want to do it for the web and it will give me the one and two by high res images for iOS one by two by three by and Android, all the different sizes that I need for Android and name them correctly for me when it outputs each of them. Give that to the developer to be able to build it. Um, lots more about XD but um, I'm going to sort of move on because I've got a bunch more to show. Okay, I'm going to jump into an app that you may not be aware of, a brand new application called Adobe Animate CC. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to build something super fast inside here. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to... Once it opens, come on. Okay, let's just grab a circle. I don't want a line. Okay, let's just draw a circle up here. I'm going to select that. So animate CC, basically creating animations. I'm going to convert that to a symbol. I'm going to call it symbol one. Um, I'm then going to come down to the timeline and I'm going to say create a classic tween. I'm going to come across the timeline. I'm going to say insert a keyframe and insert a keyframe and insert a keyframe and insert a keyframe. That'll do. I'm, I'm going to rush through this. So I come to the second keyframe. I drag it down. I'm going to put it here. I come to the next keyframe. I'm going to drag it across. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to come to this keyframe. I'm going to drag it across and I'm going to put it here come to this screen frame and I'm going to drag it across and put it here and then I'm going to play it. So what's it look like? Apart from a really bad bouncing ball. What, what does it look like? What application does it look like? It's, it's not Adobe Flash. I told you, it's... it's I showed you before, it's, it's Adobe Animate CC. And how do I know it's not Adobe Flash? 
because if I control click on it, it's all HTML5. All HTML5, just HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, etc. Um, no weird plugins, anything. It'll run on anything. It'll run on my iPhone, my iPad, anywhere I want to run it. Any browser at all, it will run in. So that's a really, I mean, that's a really simple one. Let me let me open up. Let's not save that, even though it was awesome. Um, what, let's jump across here and jump to animate. I've actually created one inside here, doing exactly what I just did then, exactly what I did. I took stuff from Dimension that didn't crash when I was building it and put, brought it into here and doing exactly the same thing as I did with the bouncing ball, just keyframes and moving. I just animated this on. So let's see what that looks like when I play it. I did nothing different in this than I did with the bouncing ball. Just keyframe move things. So now on my web page, rather than a static JPEG sitting at the top of the banner, I've now got an animated file running um, inside Animate, all HTML5, CSS, JavaScript. The cool thing about it is it's totally responsive. So if I've got it running on my desktop, I've got it running on a tablet, I've got it running on a phone, it's all totally responsive. I could put it um, wherever I want it um, and it runs. That is super simple to make. Like, that is seriously easy, and you suddenly bring your website to life instead of just having a, a, a straight um, file in it. But this is... So what have we done? I, I, should, I should tell you. What we did is we took Adobe Flash, and we totally rebuilt it from the ground up as Adobe Animate. Now it's all HTML5, CSS, and when I used to use ActionScript 3 in Adobe Flash, now I use JavaScript. It's, it's seriously simple to do. I do exactly what I used to do, but now I end up with it. Now you're going, OK, well, that's pretty simple. That's pretty easy. You can use Adobe Animate to create incredible animations, interactions, etc. So this is a super simple one. This is, there's nothing to it. It takes you no time at all to build, and you can do that seriously fast. What I want to do now is show you something more complex inside Animate. And in order to do that, I'm going to open up an application called Adobe Fuse. If you haven't seen Adobe Fuse before, what it does is it creates 3D people. OK? So inside 3D people, I'm just going to build this super fast. So I'm going to start speeding up a little bit, and I apologize for that. But I, don't, I want to show you a bunch of stuff without running out of time. So apologies for a moment. He's going to be um, just wearing underpants for a minute until I get some clothes on him. So apologies for that. If you're, please avert your eyes if you're embarrassed. Um, let's put some clothing on him really quickly. So maybe let's put uh, this top on him. Let's get some pants on him quickly. Let's throw those on. Um, and let's, I want it to look like Matt, so let's put a beard on him. Um, and let's put some glasses on him. Uh, yeah, that'll do. Okay, so really quickly, I've got a 3D sort of person here created. I don't like the, the pants thing, so I'm going to go to the textures. Let's grab the pants. Matt wouldn't wear those with it on, so I'll just go to that. That's the black. I'm just going to copy the black pants and put that on the stripe. So let's paste that onto the stripes and get rid of those. The leg edges, let's paste that on there. OK, that's better. He, he wouldn't have worn those other ones. Um, I can also then come into Customize. And inside Customize, I can customize absolutely any part of him. His arms, just to give you an idea, um, arms overall length. Let's make them longer. It's like, ah, ah. But the cool thing is the clothes, the clothes, like, grow. Wouldn't it be awesome if you had clothes like, these are little arms. Um, you can... Literally everything, and there is so much in here. So, for example, I come to the head. Just this section here, where are we? Zoom in a little bit. Just this is eyebrows. You can, like, you can control absolutely everything. Make it look like whatever you want. I'm not, I don't have time for that. You can have a play with it. It's absolutely awesome. I'm going to save that to my CC libraries. Um, then I'm going to jump into Photoshop. Let's quit out of that. I don't want to save it. Um, let's jump back into Photoshop. Uh, I got, yeah, I've got a blank file here. Inside my libraries, if I go to my Mad Coffee library, I zoom down the bottom. Here's Matt that I just created inside Photoshop. You do know that Photoshop supports 3D. You can bring 3D objects in, you can mix them, etc., and do some stuff. Um, and you can actually create like extruded text and stuff, so it's sort of cool. Now, the trouble is he's standing like this. I don't want him standing like this. I want him, he's on a paddle, stand up paddleboard, so that's what I want to do. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my 3D section inside Photoshop that gives me all the 3D controls. I'm going to select Matt, and I'm going to come up underneath these controls up here, and I'm going to type in Paddle. And it's searching through hundreds of different positions, body positions and animations that I can do inside there. Let's hit Return. 
and here's paddling. So I'm going to select paddling a single oar canoe. Now the trouble is in the canoe he's sitting down. So what I did was I took him and I made the bottom half of him invisible. I brought another copy of him in where he's standing up and made the top visible. I then, so you can see the animation that it's created on the timeline down here inside Photoshop, so he's paddling the canoe. What I then did was I grabbed the current view, I changed the camera to the top view, and I, with him standing up and paddling, I rendered out all of that animation. What does that look like once I've done it? Uh, whoops. Here is... Sorry? Does it make... The clothes he's using, can I customise? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, you can customise the clothes like... Everything like fuse? Inside fuse, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, this, you do all sorts of things. It's awesome, seriously. It, it'll make you coffee. Um, <laughs> paddle top view, Matt. Okay, so this is what I ended up with, with Matt doing it. Um, so that's, that's all the renders of Matt. I then took, I did it with Mongchi, but I got lazy with Mongchi. Well, okay, so <laughs> realistically, I got lazy. I just had her sitting down. My argument for that is that she's not very good, so I let her sit down so she wouldn't fall off on it. So this is Mongchi's um, one from above. So I rendered all of her out inside there. I took all of that, I took it back into Animate, and I built a game inside Animate, and yes, it's called SUP, or Stand Up Paddleboard, Beach Ball Air Hockey. No? <laughs> okay, so what happens inside, this is all done in Animate. All HTML5, CSS and JavaScript, let's play it. So just using my arrow keys, I'm now controlling Matt. Oh! Oh, come on, I scored in one second. Like, and Mongchi is on the WASD key. She's like, she's, oh, she's crashed already. Um, I shouldn't be rude. Oh, go, go, Mongchi. Yeah, okay, useless. Um, no, she's not. She's awesome, actually. Um, so tablet, phone, runs anywhere. This is all just done inside Animate. So right from something as simple as a simple animation right through to something as complex as a game, an interactive game like this, um, then you know, super simple to be able, well, okay, the game's not super simple to make, but um, you can do some pretty cool stuff inside there. Okay, I'm going to jump back into Illustrator just quickly to show you another cool feature inside there. Uh, Junie. Little Junie the puppy dog. So what I decided to do was take Junie and make her a bit more of a character inside um, all of the Mad Coffee stuff. So I did her as an Illustrator file. Now, I want her to do, like, different poses and stuff, but if I wanted to move anything inside Illustrator, so if you look at her, um, there's lots and lots of vectors inside here. If I want to adjust something, I have to go and move each one of those little vectors and change the Bezier handles of it. Or I can come across, and what we've added inside Illustrator is the Puppet Warp tool. This was inside After Effects, inside Photoshop, it's now inside Illustrator, only just recently. Um, Okay, and with the Puppet Warp tool, okay, what I can do is come across and put, um, just put pins, it's okay, they don't hurt. Um, I put little pins in Juni here, and what I'm doing is just putting them at paces that I want to either hold still or be able to adjust. Let's put a couple in this leg here. I'm gonna put uh, maybe three in this leg here. And what I can do now is just with these pins, I can start to warp and move around content inside here. And I can also rotate that content around. Say for example, I want to, if I wanted to move the ear, but you notice at the moment that the eye is moving as well. So let's just put a con pin inside there. And now I can move, you know, the ear around. I can rotate, you know, the ear and do different, different stuff with it. So I'm moving lots of vectors at one time, but I don't have to go and play with each little Bezier handle and curve um, as, I'm, as I'm doing them. Okay, then I did something with this Illustrator file that none of you ever, ever, ever do. I named the layers. <laughs> Not like layer 27 or copy of layer 32. 
I actually named each of them. And what I did was I took Juni and I started with the top layer group called Juni. And then inside that, I did another layer group called Head. And then I put all the head layers in there with everything. And I divided them all up into eye, right eyebrow, left eyebrow, right eye, left eye, nose, mouth, etc., all down. Then I did another group under that called Body. And I put all the, the body um, parts inside there. And then what I do is I take that file. Once it's all named and layered, I take it into character animator, uh, where's little Juni, little Juni, oh actually I'm going to show you just inside here really quickly, um, little Juni. And if you thought that um, if you thought that the um, the delivering the coffee was which one this one delivering the coffee here's Matt Matt and Junie <laughs> arriving back for, after having delivered some coffee down at Pambula Beach and then little Judy does a head a head dive. <laughs> And yeah, you get the idea. Okay, enough of that. So anyway, I took them into Character Animator. Character animators totally turned the animation industry upside down. People who did animations in the past all did them on timeline base. A lot of people used Adobe Flash to do that. Um, <laughs> and they would do it across the timeline with keyframes with every single movement on there. Um, this has really changed the way that people do it. Um, so he, uh, let me open up another scene. So here is Juni. In order to make this work, in fact, if I jump back to Juni inside here, you'll notice that this is the Illustrator file that I created. Come on, we've got too much open. Okay, that'll do. Okay, so you can see inside here, if I click off, that these are all the layers that I named. Judy, head, Ju Judy, head, all of the different elements down inside here. And once I've done all of that, I can create them, I can add them to a scene. And here I just put a surfboard that I did in uh, Dimension, etc. cetera. Um, here's Juni. And if I turn on my camera, so let's just grab this panel and see it. So what I want to do in here is turn on my camera and put my face inside this circle and hit the button down the left that says Set Rest Pose. And you can see that it's tracking. That's quite freaky. There's me on the screen. <laughs> Sorry. You didn't need to see that, sorry. Um, okay, so it's got my face, and what that means is that Junie's face is now following me, and you can see I made the ears floppy and the little chain around the neck, I made that floppy um, on there as well. And if I turn on my microphone, um, oh, actually, let me jump back to the, the character. How did I do the ears? If I select the ear, I just put a pin. You can see these tools down... These tools down the bottom down here all do different things. On the ear, I just put a couple of fi a fixed area and then a dangle button automatically, and I can control the amount of dangle and physics that it does. The same on the same on the other ear, etc. But also, if you look across at the mouth, uh, the mouth here, the mouth on the mouth, I actually did different layers for all of the different mouth shapes. And these are using phonemes. Phonemes are all the different mouth shapes that you do when you talk, like m, w, a, t, ch, you know, all of those different phases. So I did one for each of those. And the cool thing about that is that once I've done that, I can then go, oh, I'm running out of time. Um, I'm going to ignore the clock. Um, if I go back to the scene, what it means then is that if I turn on my microphone, it's actually listening to my voice, and now she's doing all of the face, all of the movement. It's also looking at my mouth as well. So if I'm not talking, so it's 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 doing both the camera and the audio as well. I can also import an audio track if I want to um, do it as well. But I can also add points to the body to do different things. So for the tail, I did a few extra layers, and I linked them just to the T key inside Character Animator. So if I press T, I've got a wagging tail. If I wanted, remember that thing that I did and did the, um, the arm moving? It's begging, so I just hit B and she begs inside here. Just so you saw how I did that inside Illustrator and did the layers. But I can also just make layers draggable. So, um, you know, if I wanted to do something like, Hi, I'm 
I'm Judy, and this is Mad Coffee here. Um, you know, I could just make bits, you know, sort of draggable and drag... For some reason, character animation makes you do silly voices, and I apologise for that. But um, So you get this idea. I also then sort of went a little bit further, because at the moment I've just got one head layer and one body layer. So what I did again was I did another version of Junie where I did three heads. You can actually do five. You can do... You can actually do right around the side, a little bit, in the middle, and do five. I just did three because I was lazy, but what that means is that when I come back inside here, I can turn my head around and I can talk and look at, um, at different directions and see things inside there. You know, all the other, all the other bits um, on there, like the begging and stuff. Um, you know, and you can do the... Oh, okay, I'll just walk over there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's some egg coffee. Um, so I can also do walking. And in fact, you just basically, it's a little, it's a little bit harder, it's a little bit harder um, with a dog with four legs. Humans are easy, you just say walking, and you add the walk control to it, tell it which the legs are and, and which the butts are. You do in character anime, it's super simple to do, which layers which and which points which. Um, dog a little bit harder because they've got four legs, um, so I had to put the walk commands on, on each leg and tell it, and they also walk the other way. So, the right front arm, you know, or oh, leg, leg. <laughs> dogs don't have arms. Um, the, the leg is, the f rear right leg is the front right leg, etc. you know, all, all of those um, sort of bits that I had to do in there as well. But yeah, Junie sort of just walks, walks back and forth. But you can also make it sneak, um, sneak and run and do all sorts of things just at a command control, simple stuff. Um, the idea of this is that you just record the timeline over and over again. I'm, 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 do you mind waiting like five more minutes while I do this last little bit? Is that okay? If you need to leave, I, I, won't, I won't be offended. But I'm just going to create a new file. Um, I did, sort of did this yesterday, so some of you have seen it. Uh, let's just save it on the desktop. Uh, let's create a new fold and call it Untitled so I can find it later. Um, and click Save. And uh, I'll just turn these off for a moment. And I'm just going to import some content. I've just got those files. Now, all I did was I took the picture of the cup into Photoshop. Now, I did do one thing in Photoshop, so I'm not, I'm not tricking you. I literally took the cup and I just divided it in half and made the bottom half the body and the top half the head. I didn't do anything else. I just literally did those two and put them on layers, just so that I could control it a little bit more. I did the same thing with the avocado toast. Um, and I'm just going to import these into Character Animator. Let's open up the cup. The reason for putting the pins in it, you'll notice that I've got all of these controls down here that I use. The reason for putting the pins in, I just want to keep the feet of the cup on the ground so that they're not flying, you know, like flying around. You do, you do the same with other objects. You can make some areas fixed and move, etc. So I'm just going to put a few um, pins in there. Um, and if I jump back to the Avo Toast, I'm going to just do the same thing and put a few fixed pins in. You'll see across here, this is... <laughs> if Toast had a face, <laughs> I could basically come in here and select a layer and say that's the pupil. Select the layer and say, that's the eye. Select another layer, that's the eyebrow. And I just literally do it here. And for the, for the body, I just basically click, put a pin, and say, that's the knee. Click, and say, that's the ankle. Very simple um, to be able to do. It's like super, simple, simple. OK. Oh, you saw the draggable before? I just put a pin in, and I just click on draggable. That, that's it. It's as simple as that um, to do. OK. I'm going to grab the bench, and I'm just going to add it to a new scene. So the bench is just a, it's a um, Adobe stock image um, that I grab, very hipster. Um, I'm going to grab the cup and just drag it onto the scene. I want to move that across, and you'll notice that across here now, I have all of these controls in real time. So think of it in two ways. I've got the model that I can rig and set all the things like, oh, I forgot to show you, I'll show you in a second, um, that I can rig all the different parts of, um, and then... In the scene where I'm doing, I can adjust those again for that live scene. So I can have the one model in different scenes adjusted differently. Down here, I can decide what I'm recording and what I'm not recording. So I've got like eye gaze. I can record it once and just do the eye movement. Record it again and do the dragging the, ar the arms around or the legs around. Um, do it again and do the face 
movements, you know, eyebrows, so it'll track your eyebrows, it'll track your eyes closing, everything that you saw it, it will do on the model, uh, do the lip sync on another one, etc. So all of those, all of those things I can do. I'm just going to push this across to one side, grab the, uh, the Avo Toast and drag that on. Let's just move that across to the other side. That'll do. Okay, and I'll drag the music in. So I've basically got four layers in my scene now. I've got the music, the toast, the cup, and the bench um, inside there. All I'm going to do is just select the cup layer, and I'm going to turn on my camera again, and once that triggers in, get a set pose. Um, and so that's now, it's basically now following me. Now, I don't need to do the drag or the eyes. There's no eyes. Um, there's no lip sync. There's no triggers. So I'm just re rewinding this, and I'm just going to play it and record that layer, and then I rewind, and I can do it again, and then do it again with all the other bits inside it. So let's just rewind that. Oh. Uh, OK, it helps when you hit the record button, not the play button. Okay, you get the idea, I'm not going to do any more. If I copy that, I'll copy that movement. So I can actually copy the same things between different layers. If I select the toast layer, I'll just rewind that and I'll just paste it on there. And then I rewind the whole thing again and play it. This is as simple as it gets. You can obviously get... Um, so, uh, I am going to just jump out and open up, I'm just going to open this up once more because there's one bit that I don't think you noticed in here and then I'm going to just show you the video at the end. Um, so I've got like two minutes to go and apologies for those people that uh, need to go. For, uh, I won't be offended at all if you run out the door. Okay, I think it's opened it. Let's go back to character animator. Here it is. Um, I don't know if you noticed, let me open up this one. It's a bit easier to see on this scene. Have you noticed that Junie's breathing? So literally, you just pick some layers and you just add a breathe command. And then you can come across and decide exactly how much Junie breathes. And all of these other controls. Every control is all adjustable for what you want for yours. Anyway, what I did was I took the whole thing a lot further. I got a really good friend of mine and colleague. He's basically same same role as me, but in the US. Um, Jason Levine, absolutely awesome guy. Some of you, you might know him. Um, and... Uh, yeah. Um, I just jump down to the bottom down here. So this is an, uh, supposedly an album work with me back in the 80s. Jason and the Junies. Um, Jason did the music. I did the character animator stuff. It's called Mad Coffee and Avo Toast. Uh, and he, if you were there yesterday, I've seen it, but... Mad coffee and apple toast. 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 If you're out surfing and you want a snack, grab the Mad Coffee mobile app. It's the biggest little secret and you love it the most. Mad coffee and apple toast. So, um, that's, uh, so hopefully today, nothing super in depth today, but hopefully you saw a sort of a range of things that you can do. There were some bits I didn't get into, some some of the video and stuff. But um, also, just one thing out of out of interest, if you're if you're interested, my son and his wife and Junie are currently travelling around Australia in their troopy, um, and they're putting some stuff up, photos. I hate him. Um, they're doing some, putting some photos up on Instagram. So um, if you want to follow them, um, it's Adventures with Juni, um, Adventures dot with Juni um, on um, on Instagram. If you want to follow them. Apart from that, folks, I've gone a little bit over time, and, and sorry for that. But hopefully you, um, you you got some ideas, some maybe a bit of fun out of today. Thanks very much for coming along. Thank you.